Today's episode of the Believe in Steelers show brought to you by betonline.ag. They'll take care of all of your NFL gambling needs this season. Head over to betonline.ag today. Spreads, player props, over-unders. If you have a place, a bet on any of the football action, betonline.ag is the place to do it. 365, 24-7. Whatever sport y'all want to bet on, make sure y'all go to betonline.ag. You can see the promo code on our screen right now. That's B-L-E-A-V to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online where the game starts. Welcome into the Believe in Steeler show. I'm Mark Bergen, joined as always by two-time Super Bowl champion, Swag and you, Pittsburgh Steelers scout, Ike Taylor. Ike coming off the Steelers' 30-6 to loss to the Houston Texans. The saving grace for us, though. We have a guest today, one of the best media members in all the NFL. Right, right. Mr. Mister uh, John McClain, he don't like when I call him Mr., but like I was telling Mr. McClain earlier, if I didn't say Mr., uh, my mom would tell me go outside and pick a switch. But we're, we're just going to introduce uh, a legend, especially in Houston and the Texas, um, all the way back to the Houston Oilers, if people can remember that, John McClain. Appreciate having you on the show. Guys, it's my pleasure, and I'm glad I screwed up last week on the technical end because I would have spent the whole show telling you guys why the Steelers were going to win the game, and uh, I would look like an idiot. wasn't the first time, wasn't been the last. I am still shocked at the decisiveness of the Texans' victory. They've now beaten Jacksonville and Pittsburgh 67-23 to in the last two games, and and this one made me a believer in D'Amico Ryans and his coaching staff. They did a tremendous job. I, you know from playing, if you've got a coach and his assistants and the message is consistent, if you see it pay off on Sunday, you're going to buy in the rest of the week. That's what's happening with D'Amico Ryans and his players. The most rookies that starters in the NFL, D'Amico Ryan, you see why he got the job now. And you always need a quarterback. And you got a young stud in C.J. Stroud. We saw what Pierce was doing last year coming out of Florida as far as like running the game, run it, the running game. Now at the same time, you get you another young stud at the wide receiving position who, who was always in Houston and, and Tank Bell. So it's just a mix with a good coaching staff. And you know coaching staff is everything. A lot of coaches, uh, they know how to coach, but they don't really know how to teach. And your best coaches have a heck of a coaching staff because they're more teachers than anything. But just to see what DeMarco Ryan is doing, John, it's very impressive, especially this early, just to see how mature C.J. Stroud looks in the pocket and how he's managing the game. It's very impressive. Stroud's still 21 years old, and I do a podcast here three times a week for the Texans flagship station, Sports Radio 610. Uh And One of the things we did uh, last week, we were talking about Stroud and – Colin Coward, right before the season started, took shots at him saying that he thought he wouldn't make it, that of the top three rookie quarterbacks, he was going to be the worst. And he talked about the record of Ohio State quarterbacks. And on our podcast, we always do a six-pack of who's up and who's down. It was hard to find players down with the Texans. So I said, well, what about Colin Coward right now? After those things he said about Stroud before the season, and Stroud's been great. Has yet to throw an interception. It's getting really good coaching. You know, there's a fallacy, and every time I see this out there, that if you've got a young quarterback, you're not going to win unless you've got an offensive head coach because that offensive head coach has to understand what that quarterback's going through. Well, Bill Cower, he did okay. Mike Tomlin's done okay. Bill Belichick, Pete Carroll, Tom Landry, I could name many more. And D'Amico Ryan's made sure – when he was hired, and all five teams tried to interview him that had openings, that he had a good coordinator. Bobby Slowick, who started with Kyle Shanahan in Washington, had been with him nine years. He could have stayed in San Francisco and had a quicker chance to be a head coach than if he came to Houston in third year of a rebuild. But Slowick wanted to call plays. Kyle Shanahan calls him in San Francisco, and everybody knows he does. So Slowick said, I need to be a play caller. I need to experience success and failure. I need to know what that's like. And I thought he started slow. He's made mistakes the first game, didn't make the same ones in the second. Made some new ones in the second, didn't make them in the third. And yesterday, when they worked really hard to run the ball, 
And remember, they weren't just missing four starters in the offensive line. They're on their third left tackle, third left guard, maybe a fourth left guard since Kendrick Green went out, third center, and third right tackle. So those backups who were out as starters weren't even supposed to be starters, and that's why I picked the Steelers to win. And I thought they would. Well, slow it came out, pitched the ball to Damian Pierce going outside instead of between the tackles, ran two in the rounds with Tank Dell just to show the Steelers they would do it. And I thought he called a great game. And when it took the Texans so many times to actually score a touchdown that counted on that first drive, I'm like, hmm, in the past, they would have had to settle for a field goal. I think they'll still lose, but that's pretty impressive. And then when it was 10-0 in the first quarter, then 16-6, I thought the Steelers were getting momentum back in the third quarter. And uh, then the, the Texans kept them, got them on that fourth and one sack of Pickett. So it's a different team here. They've got really good assistant coaches. They're buying in. Now they're two and two. I thought they'd be one and three. All four AFC South teams are two and two. And by strange quirk in the schedule, Texans play four in a row against NFC South teams. So people here, it was a great day. J.J. Watt goes in their ring of honor. They beat the Steelers more thoroughly than any time in history. Last time they beat the Steelers, 2011, Ryans was in his sixth and last season here as a linebacker. J.J. Watt was a rookie, and of course they were both there. And the Astros won the AL West uh, by winning five of the last six on the road, so it's a great wow. time to wow. be a fan in Houston. Not so much in Pittsburgh, but you guys have been spoiled through the decades. Yeah, so I, I just I just want to stay spoiled with <laughs> of course John, you do. Hey John, you hit it. You hit it on the head. Pretty much everything you said. Um, also, what I thought in the game, there was a lot of physicality, but I think Houston just hit the hardest, the longest in that game as well. Them boys on defense was definitely flying around, and they was flying around with bad intentions. So that's my personal opinion with that. A lot of open, a lot of uh, miss uh, open field tackles by Pittsburgh too as well. That's something. You didn't see with the Houston Texans, them boys was rallying to the ball. It wasn't just one person making the tackle. It was three or four people coming into that ball carrier. So I saw that as well. And they just made plays when they needed to make plays. And the crazy thing about this, John, is they're young as heck. And, it, and it's, it's scary. So you put a young, uh, confident group on the field with the all-star coaching staff, you got action for a long time. You know, so um, it was just it was just very impressive for me to see C.J. Stroud, the way he conducted himself. And if you just look at the tree, as far as like offensive coordinators, it just start with, with the great Mike Shanahan, then Kyle Shanahan, then Sean McVay, then Mike McDaniels. Now you got Slow sitting over there as the OC as well. So it's just very impressive on that tree when it comes down to OCs. But you pretty much hit it on the head when we was talking earlier in the show. We have all-star coaching staff. And you got a young group who's hungry and ready to learn. And you got a coach who understands football and five and six teams been asking for him since last year. And he chose to come back to his home, which is Houston. That says a whole lot, John. So it's, it's a little bit different when you go back home to, to coach. You put a lot of – it's a lot of passion, especially with a team that drafted you as well. So it's, it's, it's for me looking as a player because – I coach, but not on that level, just some some kids between 8 and 13. It's a little bit different when I go back to New Orleans and coach the kids than what it is in Orlando. You see what I'm saying? But the passion is all all the way in there. So um, I can see what Coach Marco Ryan is doing. Like I say, man, I, I don't think people uh, pay attention enough of a all-star coaching staff because that's the most important thing. I'm not saying it's like it was under Gary Kubiak because Kubiak had – Robert Sala, Mike McDaniel, Kyle Shanahan, Matt LaFleur, Troy Calhoun, who left after a year and is still head coach at Air Force. And that was a great coaching staff. Mike Sherman, who'd been head coach at Pittsburgh. But right now they understand the importance. I thought D'Amico Ryans needed a former head coach on his staff. They reached out to Kubiak to see if he'd be interested in coming on. And he he lives outside Houston. And he said he didn't want to get back in it. He's having too much fun traveling around the NFL where his three boys work for teams, including two with the 49ers. And he said that – but D'Amico could call him anytime he wanted to. 
and and use him any way he wants to. And so it's a really good setup. And I know it's just four games, but this team has won three games last year, four the year before, four the year before. They bring in Nick Casario to tear it all down. And in 2006, Kubiak's first season, Charlie Cashley, last year's GM, last jerk, last draft, he told me that Kubiak did the best job on a draft he'd ever seen. I said, what about Joe Gibbs? He said, Joe was great, but he was more interested in the first couple of picks. And Kubiak scouted them all down to the last pick. And last year, their draft with Derek Stingley Jr., third overall, he's on IR. Their other first-round pick, left guard Kenyon Green's on IR for the season. And they didn't get out of that draft what they are with this one. And I think we're seeing Ryan's influence with GM Nick Casario, who has final say on all personnel and how much a GM's got to make sure a coach gets the players he wants. You know, if they made Bill Cower take players he didn't want, he didn't have to play them. Right, coach right, always right. determines who plays. So uh, right now it's early. You know, we're very cautious here after losing. Texans haven't won since 2019 when they won the AFC South for the last time, beat Buffalo in a wild card game and choked a 24 point lead uh, at Kansas city. But people now are keeping their fingers crossed because they sure like what they've seen so far. I mean, even, even though it's early, John, you still got to look at, they, 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 they beat two pretty, pretty good teams. Jacksonville is no, no slouch at all. We saw how Jacksonville ended last year coming into the last season. Um, we saw Pittsburgh turn uh, nothing into something and that's good coach. No coach team from last season going two and six to winning the 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 next six out of eight games, so say. So it's good coaching on good coaching. So I'm not going to discredit Houston at all. I'm going to go ahead and get, give them any props right now instead of jumping on the bandwagon. Them boys got a young, hungry, real, real coached well team. Let me point out here, any team, any offense preparing for the Steelers got to worry about Watt and Highsmith. Right. Watt, right. I am stunned. They limited TJ to one hit on the quarterback, no sacks. Right. I Smith had three hits, no sacks. Right. They they used the tight end a lot. They used the back a lot. Somehow they got those backup linemen to do a good job. And then Stroud gets rid of the ball quick and he shows what can happen when he has a running game. And they make the play action work a little bit. They hadn't had that in the first three. But what they did to Watt and I Smith, I'm guessing. Few, if any, other teams are going to be able to do it that thoroughly. Yeah, it's hard to neutralize them, too. You know, you you got one guy, High Smith, we just paid him 60 some million dollars. That's the reason why to do double-digit sacks. And we just know with uh, the extraterrestrial T.J. Watt is E.T. homeboy, when he does week in and week out when it comes down to just making plays and sacks. But for that for that, for that, that offensive line and that group to, to neutralize them, too, them two young men, that says a lot about the coaching part and how the young team is buying in. I got something else. The Texans secondary, which is missing two starters, they had their starting safeties for the first time, Jimmy Ward and Jalen Petrie. If you look, Pickens and uh, Austin, neither one of them averaged nine yards a catch. That's amazing. Somehow they kept Pickens from catching a ball down the field. And they'd had, what, two long touchdown passes right. in the previous two games. And I don't know how much of that was the Texans. I don't know how much of it was Pickett. Right. But being able to limit the Steelers' big pass plays down the game here was amazing for them to be able to do that. They got better pressure. Texans had six tackles for loss. That equaled their total for the first three games. So they played run well except for the third quarter. But uh, being able to keep the Steelers from connecting down the field to me was pretty remarkable. Now they are, uh, I mean, the two safeties are their personality in the secondary. Uh, when you got, and I just look at the safeties we had in Pittsburgh, uh, from Troy, Tyrone Carter, Chris Holt, Ryan Clark, um, I got Anthony Smith, you can just go out of, down the line. And it was, you know, receivers at some point in time, they get to watch and tape. When they watch tape, man, they see fear. You know, they uh, when you see when you see safeties that don't mind just letting the corners catch the ball with interceptions, they just want to strike and inflict pain. And you see that on tape, you know. So it's like, you know, how, how am I gonna land? Um, what rib is gonna get broken today? 
So that's that's exactly what it is when you got got two safeties with the same mentality. Because usually two safeties, one or the other, you usually got a safety who want to cover, and you got a uh, safety who wants to hit. When you got two safeties that want to do both, um, it's like having twins back there. So I mean, coach. Coach Ryan, he knows exactly what he's doing. You can just tell by their personality on having guys in San Fran. And if you talk and listen to Fred Warner, when Coach Ryan had left, Fred Warner had nothing but praise. He said Coach Ryan was the only one that believed in him. And now that you look at Fred Warner, he's one of the best in the business to do it in the NFL when it comes down to linebacker position. So they say you're all your coach's personality. And Coach Ryan uh, is nothing but a tough son of a gun who played linebacker in the league. And all he wanted some old school dogs. So you can you can you can you can kind of see where they're going as far as like drafting. They want to be the San Francisco 49ers of the South and the AFC. That's exactly what they want to be. The tough, physical, we're gonna run to the right. You're gonna know we're gonna run to the right, and you can't stop us. Work out the players can pass. Uh let CJ use his legs a little bit, and we got Pearson Company that's gonna run you run the ball down your throat. On the defensive side, all we want to do is inflict, inflict pain. So um, I really do believe that statement. Um, you are your coach's personality when it comes down to personnel and having an attitude or not or being a finesse team. And Coach Ryan, you just can't say enough about him so far. Ike, I'll piggyback off that too to yes, say – we love the 49ers and their defense heat seeking missiles is what we always say for like the last five years in San Francisco. But John, I want to flip and go to the other side of the ball for the Steelers with the struggles offensively 53 total yards of offense in the first half for the Steelers. We were talking some before the pod about the critical fourth and one play in the second half. You've covered this league for a long, long time. What do the Steelers need to do to try to fix some of their offensive struggles through the first four weeks of the season? Well, you got two good running backs, and obviously Kenny Pickett is struggling. He made some decisions. And I'm not just talking about with the ball. I'm talking about which way he would turn. Like, really, that sack on fourth and one by Jonathan Grenard, it was a difference maker, but Pickett tur- went right into it. Right, he was right. being blocked by the left tackle. And then all of a sudden, Grenard sees Pickett coming right to him, so he just sheds, take a couple steps right, and sacks him. And and to me, that was on Pickett. And then I know you guys have not heard this before, uh, so I'll tell you something I know that is not being said up there. Canada's doing a terrible job. (laughs) (laughs) And some of that play calling being the shotgun on fourth and one, and you got Najee Harris, who is having a really good third quarter, powering the ball. That was just a bad play call. Putting it in Pickett's hands instead of Harris's hands, especially when Harris was running so effectively, that was just a bad play call. And uh, that's, you know, Mike Tomlin said there's going to be changes made. I'm guessing it's not going to be on his staff. I'm eager to see what that is. But they just don't look like your typical Mike Tomlin coach team right now. And it's not like Tomlin got stupid all of a sudden. It's right. probably the players, personnel, but it doesn't look like they're making the best use of their personnel either. Because, or maybe the Texans just a whole lot better than uh, I think they are, and maybe they will be. I picked them to win six games, doubling last year's win total, and I'm like, oh, boy, everybody else is picking them to be second-worst team in the league to Arizona. And uh, so – I may have to rethink that, but it's going to take a few more games right. before I do. But the Steelers kind of look discombobulated. They're not uh, – they don't strike fear anybody on defense. I've been coming to Pittsburgh since the late 70s. And, boy, teams used to hate going to Three Rivers. They hated going to Heinz Field at times, but it was Three Rivers when they hated it the most. And teams don't hate to come there anymore. I mean, you, you you said, John, you said something right there. Um, you said something right. When when I played, uh, the first thing that came out of opposing team's mouth, mouth was, we know we got to bring our big boy pass and we know we got to play physical against Pittsburgh. Absolutely. I, I don't I don't hear that as of as of late now. Um, I do hear that when they talk about the San Francisco 49ers, you got to bring your big boy pass. I don't hear that 
um, of late talking about the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I think that's an issue, John. I think that's a problem. I think by the end of the day, um, I do want to see Pittsburgh back to their old days of the physicality part where people are scared to come into Pittsburgh and they know they got to be in the cold tub after the game for the next week. That's what I love to see. Um, I would love to see headlines being other teams, opposing teams, talking about Pittsburgh and the physicality of Pittsburgh. That's what I would love to see. Um, and the reason why I would love to see that is just proven. You know, when you walk up on the second floor on the south side at the facility and you see them six, six Lombardis, the first thing you think about is physicality on the defensive side and everybody was just scared to play them and they'll just run the air out the ball. We used to call it a six-minute offense. Um, when I played and who was winning Super Bowls, we couldn't wait till eight minutes was left because we knew Jerome Bettis and Deuce Staley and Willie Parker would just run the air out the ball for six minutes. You know, so we didn't have a two, three uh, minute offense. Uh, Coach Kyle wanted that at a, one, at a certain point in time, we're going to run this ball for six minutes. And that, that, that said a lot about the personality. You can only imagine the training camps that we had, John, uh, with the with the Jerome Bettises and the Deuce Staley's and them guys sitting in the backfield, 240 plus. But that's what I'm missing. That's And that's what I miss seeing. It all starts up front on both sides of the yeah. ball. That physicality came. You mentioned those running backs. You knew they were going to pound and pound and pound some more. And it started with the offensive line. And you knew that front seven with good linemen and great linebackers. Oh, yeah. They were going to shut you down. And uh, I watched it when I covered the Oilers for from 77 till they left here after the 96 season. And then I've seen it since. But it's got to start up front with the linemen and the mentality. And you know Tomlin's got that – mentality that's that that's his right, trade right. part but right. they got to get the players and the other coaches to carry it out yeah john i'm with you there too because pickett's best play was on a scramble the to the left outside of the pocket Najee harris picks up blitz protection and leaks out and catches the ball falls down gets back up and goes for i don't know another 10 or 15 yards that play's not scripted right like a good coordinator is going to have scripted plays for his young quarterback Kenny Pickett's in his 16th start on time, on target. Here's how we're going to try to execute the game plan. That's just a play is broken down in the backyard. You're trying to make something out of nothing. I need to see more scripted plays of, hey, here's where you're going to go with the football to get the ball in the hands of our playmakers schemed up. I just haven't seen enough of that with Canada. I can't wait to see how the Steelers bounce back. And then when – who do they play next? Baltimore. So they play Baltimore, and you know that's going to be a physical game. Texans began the season at Baltimore. And uh, so I'm eager to see if the Steelers bounce back and it's your typical Steelers-Ravens game or if the Steelers get beat again with the same issues. And I know you guys are eager to see. But Tomlin, Tomlin's a great coach. He's not going to let this team play like this consistently. Yeah, he, he, he different. Um, and I, I've, I've seen it live in action. Since I'm on the scouting department side, I just seen Coach T um, from a different angle. I'm, I'm like, man, I don't even see how he do it. Uh, he actually lives football. That's that that is that is his life. From the front office side to the coaching side to the film side, all he know and all he want to do is football. All, if you give him 20, 24 hours out the day, he want 24 hours out the day just on football. That's all, that's all that young man wants. So it was very impressive for me, especially this offseason, to see how Coach T worked, uh, not only the film room um, in the front office, but how he handled himself just in general, uh, being a general, so say, in that building. So um, Coach T, you know, go to go 2-6 and six and go 9, what did, what did it win, 9-8 and eight last year? You start off 2-6 and six and then finish off at 9-8. and eight. That says a lot about Coach T. Um, we just getting tired of them struggles. You know, Mark, you got it up there right now. How to fix the Steelers' offense yeah. struggles? We just getting tired of seeing the struggles because because we're so accustomed and used to being spoiled. You know, the eleven and fives, the twelve and fours, and that haven't came around as much as often. So, welcome to the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. We appreciate your time this morning following the Steelers' loss to the Texans, and I know you're keeping busy. Columns, podcast appearances, 
uh, in radio appearances. I know Sports Radio 610 is where people can find you. If there's anything else you need to plug, feel, feel free to take the opportunity to do so. SportsRadio610.com. It's free, free, free. Guys, thank you very much for having me, and good luck to Mike Tomlin and the Steelers the rest of the season. Appreciate you, John. Thank you. Thank you, John.